thanks so much for the introduction. I'm always looking for an opportunity, uh, thanks, and for the invitation. I'm always looking for an opportunity to get out of the office. So thank you. Um, the part about the contractor me, uh, is important because I have to start with a standard disclaimer that as a contractor, I don't speak and cannot speak on behalf of the US government. So anything I say today is strictly from my point of view, hence the asterisk and the disclaimer on the title slide. So uh, before I get to the ecosystem services work and ecosystem management at NOAA as a whole, um, and then talk, uh, get into the natural capital work, I'm gonna start with a primer on how NOAA is organized because I think it helps situate me in what is um, an organization of 12,000 personnel. And now that I say that, I don't know if that 12,000 actually includes contractors, but I digress. Um, NOAA is one of 12 bureaus in the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, and there are two major chunks of the organization, as you will. Um, the corporate function include the agency's head, the uh, Undersecretary for Commerce uh, for Oceans and Atmosphere, which I think is a really cool title. Um, we don't have one right now. That, that person is a political appointee, um, and we're awaiting a nomination from the, from the current administration. And then there are also corporate services offices and staff offices, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, then NOAA has a series of line offices, which is really where a lot of the like on the ground works get, gets done. Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service partners with uh, regional councils on fisheries management. So they assist and predict stock, uh, fish stocks. They set the catch limits. Um, they ensure compliance with fisheries regulations. Uh, the National uh, the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations runs all of NOAA's ships and, um, and planes, including the hurricane hunter folk who, when people are fleeing hurricanes, they're actually flying into them, which I think is crazy, but you know, um, everybody has their thing. Uh, the Ocean Service works a lot with coastal communities and really building resilience in those coastal communities. Uh, research, uh, the Office of Atmospheric and uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research is uh, the research arm of the organization it includes units like the National Sea Grant Program, which we were just having a quick conversation about. For those of you who don't know students around here, there's a Canals Fellowship that places you in places in DC to work on various things, and it's, that's run through the, um, the National Sea Grant Program. Uh, then there's the Satellite Division. The National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service is responsible for housing all of the global data that NOAA produces, which is terabytes from what I understand. And then of course there's a weather service which provides all the, the, the data, and the forecasting information that forms the basis of pretty much every forecast that you see. So all the stuff that you see on the local um, news comes from the weather service. So the chief economist's office, uh, here's, a, here's a, the corporate services and staff offices that I mentioned under corporate functions at NOAA. So the chief economist's office is housed uh, actually under the CFO, which at first didn't make sense to me, but now it kind of does because we work on agency-wide um, things that relate very closely to the performance and the risk management and the risk management functions at NOAA. So the performance risk and social science office is actually a very uh, a relatively new office at NOAA. It's only been around for a year or so. Um, broadly, we work, again, on the performance measures for the agency, so we track how NOAA is doing. We also are responsible for contributing to the, strate the strategic plans, both for NOAA and for the Department of Commerce. Um, and then risk management at an agency-wide level is something that we're just getting into. So, uh, oh, and then there's the social science folk, of course, which is where um, I am. A little introduction to our office. The office, the social science part of performance, risk, and social science is led by Dr. Monica Grasso, who's the chief economist. Um, and our job is really to ensure that the agency makes the most use out of the social and behavioral and economic sciences as it possibly can throughout decision making. So um, under leadership coordination, for example, we convene the social science committee, which has representatives from each of the NOAA line offices that I mentioned earlier. Um, the public-private collaboration for sustainable business practices is where the natural capital work that I will talk about in a minute falls under. In terms of um, economic valuation, one of the things that we're working on right now, which is 
shock, somewhat shockingly, the first time that this has been done, is to produce an economic impact report that is specifically geared for an external audience. So how is NOAA contributing to the national and local, for, to the local and national economy? And then the risk communication work that we do is really um, geared towards how we communicate uncertainty and risk both within NOAA and to constituents. So for example, how do we, the cone of uncertainty that you see in those, um, in, the, in the hurricane tracks, like how do we communicate what that actually means to somebody who's actually going to make a decision? So with the risk communication work in July of 2016, we released a, a report on best practices and research findings, and so we're working on implementing some of those findings, which include um, convening kind of an agency-wide group to get a handle on what is actually going on within the agency. So that's a lot about the Chief Economist Office. Um, did I miss a slide? Oops, I think I went too far. All right, so I started at NOAA on October the 5th in 2015, and the Ecosystem Services Memo was released on October the 7th. And I didn't quite get it immediately, um, but the memo itself was co-signed by three uh, offices, uh, three of the uh, places in the uh, administrator, sorry, in the executive office of the president, OMB, the Office of Science, uh, Science and Technology Policy, and then the Council on Environmental Quality. So once the president's office issued that memo, it then went to the cabinet offices, and the Department of Commerce is among those, and then it gets to NOAA. So it was probably at least a week or so before I actually uh, got the, the, the notice that I would be working on this. And it landed in our office because we um, were already convening a group on ecosystem services, uh, a team, sorry, that was already considering how NOAA visualizes ecosystem services. So I was rather lucky in that when it came to actually putting together the response, I had a ready group of people to kind of vet it and also to help me move it through the agency process. So the memo itself asked for a couple of things. It asked for a description of what the agencies were currently doing in ecosystem services. It asked us to tell um, CEQMB and OSTP uh, what we were intending to do in terms of keep uh, integrating ecosystem services into the work that we were doing. And given that the due, due date was March the 30th, it really meant that I had even less time to get it through because um, the Department of Commerce chose to um, compile all our results and send it as, as an entire uh, packet. So I basically had three months to get through, um, th to get it through all those line offices and, um, and back to the Department of Commerce for whatever clearance process I had to go through. So the final, I actually did, unfortunately didn't get to see the final product that the Department of Commerce sent, but um, the response combined, I think at least I know for sure that the Economic Development Administration and uh, NTIS also submitted uh, responses to the memo and then that went to the Department of Commerce. So the latest on this piece is that the implementation, the Council on Environmental Quality was supposed to release an implementation guidance for agencies after um, we'd submitted our work plans. And from what I understand, that is still at OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, Budget they're ready to release it for, for public comment, but I, I can't exactly tell you when that would happen. It, the, the whole thing is not dead, but it's just dormant, as I like to think of it. So, how is it that the memo even came to be? According to the folks that I've spoken with, a lot of the work that agencies do is driven by both top-down factors and bottom-up factors. Um, top-down, you need some direction from the administration to actually say, hey, federal agencies, you're gonna do X, Y, and Z. And then bottom-up, you really need sound science, such as the stuff that's being done in these very halls, and you need the socialization of that science to get people uh, acclimated to using terms like ecosystem services and natural capital. With regard to the ecosystem services memo, the, uh, the to ecosystem services, the memo itself was definitely that top-down driver that came directly from the administration. Um, in terms of bottom-up, there are a couple of things uh, that I'll get to in a minute, but I just wanted to give you a visual of what 
the things that were important in, in this case. So the memo itself obviously didn't appear out of thin air and I just pulled, uh, the, the list that I'm about to show you is by no means exhaustive. I just pulled a couple of things from the Obama administration specifically that talked about ecosystem services. So the PCAST re report discussed um, the needs and opportunities for federal agencies to better fulfill their responsibilities in terms of protecting environmental capital and ecosystem services. Now every so often there is an event of some sort that has a, a profound effect on moving the conversations forward more quickly than they, than they traditionally would have happened. When Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012, that brought to the forefront all these conversations about green infrastructure and how to, um, how to make the best, how to use natural and nature-based infrastructure to protect um, coastal areas and to uh, increase resilience to uh, climate events. So the Climate Action Plan that was also released under the admi Obama administration um, called for innovative strategies um, in the Hurricane Sandy affected region, again to strengthen the community's resilience to future uh, extreme weather events. And then in August uh, 2015, just before the Ecosystem Services Memo came out, the Centers Committee, which is under the National Science and Technology Council, produced a report that responded directly to one of the recommendations in the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Strategy. And that uh, talked about, again, this need for green infrastructure. In terms of some of the bottom-up events that were happening, um, I think many are familiar with the Costanza paper from 1997 that was on valuing ecosystem services and natural capital. Um, the Natural Capital Project released uh, early editions of INVEST, which is the uh, open source suite of tools for mapping and valuing ecosystem services. Uh, the Ecosystem Services Partnership, which is run out of Vanningen University in uh, the Netherlands, hosted the first uh, a community on ecosystem services con conference in 2008. More locally here, the NEST Partnership, which is uh, hosted by the, by, at Duke University, brought together some of the federal agencies to produce a guidebook specifically for federal agencies on how to value ecosystem services. And, uh, oh, I, I cannot forget to mention, um, Dr. Monica Grasso, who is, the, uh, who is the current chief economist, was on the Costanza paper, and she just told me that uh, their 20 years later paper is coming out sometime this year, so keep an eye out for that. I guess through this whole process, what became evident is that NOAA is moving away from this single species, single issue management towards more of an ecosystem approach, which I realize is not groundbreaking, but is really heartening because the, the process in federal agencies is actually, unfortunately, a little slower than it could be. Um, but this is, NOAA is really committed to taking an ecosystem approach to, uh, to management. So the, uh, one, a couple of examples here, the ecosystem-based fisheries management policy was released by NOAA Fisheries um, in 2016. And then uh, the National Estuarine Reserve Research Reserve System, so the NIRS, are using more of an ecosystem services approach. So EV, what I learned was that ecosystem-based management and ecosystem services are very different. Uh, they're very different approaches in, uh, in NOAA and, and they mean very specific things. But at the end of the day, it's about managing ecosystems and moving away from that single species manage, single species, single issue management to an ecosystems approach, which um, I, again, I, what you call it doesn't matter, but how are we thinking more holistically about how we manage marine resources? So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the natural capital work that we're getting into. Um, and when I say the term natural capital, I mean the stock of uh, renewable and non-renewable resources that combine to flow, to, to provide value both to, to businesses and society. So ecosystem services is kind of that bridge between the stock of natural capital and the value. Uh, and great example, eelgrass beds are great at improving water clarity. 
Nobody wants to boat in the dirty lake, so it's kind of, um, that's where the, the stock translate into a service translates into a value for humans. So if we look at the top down, bottom up approach again, um, in terms of the natural capital work at NOAA, the top down really came from a goal and objective in the Department of Commerce strategic plan for 2014 to 2018. So we're coming up on the end of it. And actually we're just in the process of providing input into the next strategic plan. So it'll be interesting to see where where this work lands. But the uh, goal three is the environment goal or was the environment goal. And, um, and under that, the objective five was specifically about helping businesses adapt and prosper to um, environmental and climate. Ooh. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, what happened? We started because of a problem. And I guess we'll wait and see. But anyway, so Goal 3.5 was tasked not only to NOAA, but a couple of other uh, units in the, uh, in the Department of Commerce, most notably the, uh, the Economic and Statistics Administration, um, the International Trade Administration, the National um, Institute for Science and uh, for Standards and Technology, sorry, so those are the folk who come up with standards for like building codes and all that kind of stuff. And then of course NOAA. So maybe we'll give it a minute. Um, Hopefully this will catch up with us. <laughs> but oh, so in terms of responding to um, the strategic plan, and uh, maybe I should wait for this to start because that's why you, wouldn't, you won't get the picture of it. But um, one of the first steps to addressing natural capital was actually understanding what businesses want. And so my next slide would have been <laughs> the natural capital business roundtables. And these were basically a series of listening sessions for uh, the Department of Commerce to actually go out there and hear what businesses need from the Department of Commerce so they can actually thrive and prosper in their, um, in their work. So there were four business uh, roundtables, and eventually we'll get to there, but there was one in the Gulf of Mexico and that specifically targeted the oil and gas and shipping industries. And how the roundtables worked was we, um, we as a NOAA partnered with a local entity to help us um, host and actually manage the event. So the Gulf of Mexico Natural Capital Roundtable was uh, hosted at Rice University Center for Energy Studies. Um, and that was in Houston, Texas. That happened on April the 16th in 2015. There was one in the Great Lakes, which uh, specifically focused on manufacturing and Case Western Reserve was the host um, uh, and a unit for that. In the Northeast, we looked at finance and reinsurance and the real estate business uh, and the real estate, um, sorry, industry. And that was hosted at Columbia University. And then the last one was at Silicon Valley and that obviously tackled, um, was aimed at the high tech uh, world, but also um, the tourism industry. Unfortunately, I, th I think I, this was all before I started, but I, what I heard was the tourism uh, folk didn't, weren't as energized and jazzed about this, so they didn't really come. And that, um, that uh, event was hosted at Stanford University Woods, Woods Institute. So in all, I think there were over, I think 130 individuals and, par and participants at the round tables. Um, some were from the private sector, but there were also some NGOs, um, international organizations. There were state, local, and regional governments that also attended. And then at the end of the, the, the round tables actually culminated in a um, natural capital summit that was held in DC. Um, and that's kind of when I started getting involved in the natural capital work. So what did we actually hear from the companies? Well, for one, the, the stakeholders that attended the roundtables were really interested in mitigating risk, and specifically natural capital risk, in a very business-specific way. They um, mentioned that uh, a lot of competitors and, and where the markets were going drove their work. So, for example, Whirlpool said that if 10 to 15 percent of their customers were willing to pay more for a product that is environmentally friendly, then they would actually go ahead and, and, and make that. Um, and then there were, there were, there was also uh, comments about 
uh, regulations and, and making it and basically incentivizing businesses to actually um, innovate and 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 incorporate kind of these natural capital principles. So, in terms of successes among the businesses, we heard that it was best, it was easiest for them to integrate natural capital principles in the work that they were already doing. If they couldn't, if they had to come up with something new, it was re, it was a little harder to bu to get buy-in. That buy-in worked best when it came from the top brass, so the CEO and the CFOs, like that's the level of people who needed to buy into this idea of integrating natural capital. And then um, finally, they, they liked this idea of a stepwise approach to building, um, to, building uh, to integrating natural capital. So they wanted to start with the things that had surefire payoffs that were easy to implement as a way for building evidence for why they should actually incorporate natural capital into the things that they were doing. Some of the common barriers that we had uh, that we heard about uh, integrating natural capital was a lack of business um, relevant data. Oh, in the back from business maybe. Give me a minute. So. Um, as I was saying, some of the, 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 since natural capital projects don't really necessarily lend themselves to traditional accounting methods, we heard from businesses that they were really looking for methods on how to value natural capital, which is fortuitous because what I'm going to talk about next is how the Natural Capital Coalition has been helping in that process. Um, again, they were looking for incentives and, um, and, uh, Hopefully this will be overcome by some of the things that, uh, some of the work that we're doing now will help overcome some of the barriers that they were stating, such as they wanted better case studies, more contextual information, and they also wanted a role in policy discussions, which will be interesting in terms of actually seeing that happen, but um, I think that's a, that's a nut that we can try and figure out how to crack. So, if this fires up, Um, so that, the roundtables were kind of phase one of the, uh, of the, of that, of the project. Um, and there were a couple of outputs from that. One was a national capital website, which, uh, was a great landing page for businesses interested in learning about natural capital and had never heard of it. Um, then we also had, uh, this ready built in stakeholder network, which was awesome. Um, and we're planning to keep in touch with some of those folk. We haven't done as much yet, so we're kind of in the uh, wait and see phase, but we have a great, um, we have this great opportunity to keep engaging with the folks who attended the Natural Capital um, roundtables and a chance to in include them in a lot of the conversations that we're having right now um, and, and will be into the future. And then finally, um, we joined, as, and we as in the Department of Commerce, not just NOAA, joined the Natural Capital Coalition, which is um, a, a, a global multi-stakeholder membership organization, basically. It doesn't cost anything to join, which is always appealing to government en entities, but it includes like a, 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 what you see in those jigsaw pieces of the different actors who are members of the coalition. And I think they're up to about 250 members right now. Um, so the coalition produced this document called the Natural Capital Protocol, which again addressed the um, issue about how to actually go through the uh, through the business, through the process of um, valuing natural capital in the business context. So there's this great protocol that has nine steps that helps managers and it was specifically targeted for business managers, help them go through the actual process of uh, not only like scoping the project, but starting with why are we even doing this? Why is it worth your time to consider natural capital all the way through applying it? So in phase two of the work, um, there, there are two main streams of work. One is producing an ocean supplement to the protocol 
and then some of the work that I'm doing with some of the with the other bureaus in the Department of Commerce. So the protocol itself is um, it, it, it the, forms the basis for several other documents that have been produced since. The sector guides are those uh, are are um, specifically target different sectors within, as the name implies, different sectors within of businesses. For the food and uh, beverage and the apparel ones are out. The build environment um, sector guide, I think, is coming out very soon. And then there are the supplements, which deal with more cross-cutting cross issues, which is where the ocean supplement fits under. I think the finance sector is right now in consultation and is, and is pretty much ready to go. So if you're interested in, in how natural capital is applied in the finance sector, check that out. So in terms of the ocean supplement, it's really being led by NOAA, um, the Natural Capital Coalition, of course, Conservation International, which is a, an NGO based in Virginia, and then the, um, International, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, and they're helping really host a lot of the events. But um, ultimately, the goal is to streamline how we, how we include marine natural capital, so everything related to the ocean, basically into businesses and decision making. In terms of where we are with the project, um, we're still in the kickoff phase, which means we're, uh, yeah, we're still figuring out like who should be involved in the project, how are we actually going to go through it, how are we gonna fundraise for it, because of course, um, each one of those entities doesn't have a dedicated funding stream to work on this. It's more like people are donating their time right now to, to, get, it, to get it done. So how do we actually build funding to get this through? Um, like other additions uh, to the protocol, so some of those other, se the sector guides and supplements, this is a highly collaborative process, and the Natural Capital Coalition has been really good about convening groups of people, both locally, both here in the U.S. and internationally, to kind of, to develop all these, um, to develop all these uh, supplements and, um, and sector guides. It is probably going to take us at least 18 months, we'll see, um, We'll see where we are. I think we're slightly behind schedule. Um, on to the second stream of work. So a couple of the, oh, actually more than a couple, of the Department of Commerce bureaus have come together um, to work on increasing uptake of the protocol and the principles in the protocol in the United States, which is one of the things that we notice. So it involves not only us, again, ESA, um, and uh, ITA are involved, and we're trying to work with census more because they have really good data sets on where people are and where businesses are, so we're um, working with them more and more to kind of get it also that data piece. So again, the goal is to empower U.S. businesses to make the best decisions that account for um, their impacts and dependencies on nature, and to do this, we're starting with a focus on some of the smaller medium to smaller to medium enterprises. One of the things that we noticed about the protocol is it really requires somebody with a, with a technical know-how and the funds to have like a sustainability officer to run um, the whole process throughout the, throughout the company. So what we're doing is thinking about some of those smaller to medium enterprises to help them along. Um, baby steps, we don't wanna like rush into anything. So we're starting with like pilot projects and um, right now we're targeting the, the businesses that the International Trade Administration serves, which are, uh, again, sort of the small to medium enterprises, but the unique thing about the, the International Trade Administration is it works with businesses that work overseas. So if an American company, for example, sets up an office in, I don't know, Germany, and they have to understand some of the laws and regulations in the country that they're working in, how can we help them actually uh, do that in a meaningful way? And eventually we're, th we're thinking we might um, develop a toolkit that is again based on the protocol. All this great work has been done, so why reinvent the wheel? Um, but again, still kind of early in this project as well. So um, to review, I guess the ecosystem memo, s services memo came at a time when NOAA was already thinking about how we uh, view and manage ecosystem services in our agency. I think. Um, it's great to see that we're moving away from the single species, single issue um, style of management into something more, um, into something more holistic. 
um, the national capital work that we're doing now builds off of the successes of the round table. And um, I think the, o the ocean supplement work has particularly been an enjoyable because we get to work with so many people. Um, and not always, it's great to have that perspective from, from other parts of the world. Um, and then the work with the other DOC bureaus is creeping along, but we'll make it there eventually. So I'm happy to take any questions. I'm sorry I can go through any slides that you guys would like to see um, as I was trying to catch up with everything. <laughs> you can start. <laughs> We got to write the rules. I think, I, again, it goes back to they're just uh, ecosystems and how we manage them. They're just, a f they're different conversations happening at the, within the agency. Again, fisheries, uh, and I'll use them, I'll put them out there. They are specifically focused on ecosystem-based management, whereas the Ocean Service, for example, looks at things from an ecosystem services lens. But I think one of the, in convening a group, we actually had like this long conversation among the two line offices that were mainly involved in this. But at the end of the day, we decided that from our perspective, it, it, it matters. But really, if we're communicating that information to the outside world, all they care about is how we manage the ecosystems. What we call it at the end of the day really doesn't matter. Hi, thank you. My name is Adam Fishman. I'm a second year MEM student here. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, just a quick question on your choice of selection for the local partners in the roundtables. Mm -hmm. They were all universities or research institutes housed within yep. universities. Was that a strategic choice to maybe depoliticize a little bit? Was that to get local knowledge? What, oh, what were the criteria question. behind that selection? I, I wasn't there when most of the roundtables were run. Um, let me go back to that slide. But from what I remember, I think actually a lot of it had to do with how government funding works. Like we, what we can and cannot do, I think it was easier to just have, um, to work with an institution and have them be the host rather than figure out like the transfer of money and the justification and how, and how that fit into, into you know, some of the performance measures that, that the agencies are, are held to because there are very specific things that we can and cannot do, and I, and I think it was just easier in this case to work with an entity that has a little more flexibility. Yes. Hi, I think you did a great job without <laughs> computer issues, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just curious, I see a lot of the conflict in ecosystem services more of a, at the coastal level, and this kind of interface between state and federal waters, and I'm wondering, uh, if you guys are kind of facilitating these discussions at a state level as well, or kind of in the re through the regional management councils or something, for example. Mm. Now the councils are unique to the fishery service. So okay, yeah. um, there are other, some of the other line offices have their own regional structures. So in the case of the ocean service, I'm not sure how that works actually. Um, hmm. That's a great question. Actually, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but I w my, my, my guess is there are, I mean, NOAA is heavily involved in at least providing the information to help people make decisions. So I would assume in that case, we might be viewed as, as more of an, ob an objective voice. But again, I can't 100% I can't say, say that that's, tr that's for sure. I, I'd be curious to know. Now I'm going to find out. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Couple questions here. Thank you for your talk. Um, so, I'm interested in the attitudes that the business, the private sector, has towards all this because we have the president um, announcing that he really wants to uh, try to streamline the government and minimize regulatory burden on the commercial activity. Um, 
we have businesses, sometimes some people think it's greenwash sort of saying they want to do this, but people are suspicious whether they want to do it. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think the attitude is of the private sector towards the, the natural capital? Are they really want to do it or are they going to fight it and claim that it's going <laughs> to be turned into regulations? I'm just curious yeah. what your understanding of their deep motivation might be or deep understanding of yeah. natural capital is. I'd say a couple of things to that. First of all, the words natural capital place it in a very specific um, business term. We'd like them to consider nature as they do other forms of capital like people and, and all those other things. Um, Second, businesses, for them, it's all about their bottom line. That's what they care about. If they can make the business case for why something is good and uh, to their leadership, then I think they're more likely to, to, to implement it. And then finally, I think at some point, they, they, the realization on their dependence of nature is going to hit them, whether it's now or later. And so it would behoove them to take advantage of these opportunities now to start thinking proactively about that. Again, the bigger and the bigger, the larger corporations get it. The Coca-Colas, the Googles, they have sustainability offices. They have people who, speci who specifically think about their dependence on nature. But um, in terms of some of the smaller to medium enterprises, I think it'll start to hit them when supply chains are, are somehow disjointed. Like if you suddenly lose all the capability to get water for a bottling plant and you manufacture you know, soda or whatever. That's an issue. So I think at some point they're going to hit a, something is going to jolt them into action. It would behoove them to think ahead, but bottom line sometimes rules out. Thanks for your talk. So I was curious about your slide on how the concept of ecosystem services got into NOAA. Mm -hmm. And you have this slide where you show that there's this bottom top down and bottom up, yeah, mm -hmm. that slide, yep. that's that slide and, and others before it. So, yep. um, and your description of this is, makes me, my interpretation of what you said is that it was the confluence of many things happening yes. over a long period, right? Bob Costanza's paper came out 20 years ago, the Invest Project out of NatCap is yep. almost 20 years old, yep. I mean there, and these involve lots of different people, mm -hmm. um, but it also seems, again, my interpretation is that it was accidental, and that at th I think at one point you said, well, you need someone in the administration from the top-down perspective to yep. be the champion, yep. so how can you, how can we um, streamline this? Is it possible to streamline this so that it's not so accidental? Um, the bottom-up factors actually involve many different yeah. organizations yep. and groups yep. and actors, and, and again, over a really long period, and it's yep. very slow and inefficient. <laughs> I think it, it requires paying attention to what the priorities of the administration are, first of all, and those are usually pretty clear, like if you read, right now the Trump administration has some very clear signs that infrastructure, for example, is a big priority, and how to help businesses is a big priority. So that's one thing, Keep, pay attention to what the, the, the administration is saying in terms of what they're doing. And then the other thing is um, just keep, keep, keep talking to each other and keep socializing the science. So. Um, call somebody at NOAA and say, hey, I have this great idea. And I was wondering, people are actually pretty receptive. Like, you can look us all up and call us. Um, and just talk to the, the people in the relevant agencies and the work that you do to, to get, to get that, that, um, that ball rolling. Because that's really where um, I think, I, that's, that's one of the areas where I think there's a disconnect is people tend not to, you know, just talk to the federal agencies. Go ahead and do so. And there are, there are, I will admit that there are policy windows that open up that something suddenly becomes a priority and there's nothing we can do about that. But I really do think that keeping track of what the priorities of the administration are and having those conversations with the people in the agencies will help along that process. Hi, thank you very much again for being here. Uh, my name is David McCarthy. I'm an MEM here at the School of Forestry, and I have a more philosophical sort of bird's eye question, mm -hmm. which is that um, while I definitely think nature as capital is a great way for businesses to start 
bringing nature into their thought con their thought constructs and to view it less as a stock and more for its emergent properties. But in the time being, it from my perspective, it, it also feels a little bit more like a, a harm reduction within uh, forest and ecosystem management, especially in mm -hmm. supply chains. So uh, my question is, is there a goal to eventually tip to scale on the, on the perspective that n nature actually governs us rather than we can govern nature and, and to start having a conversation along the lines of what nature and ecosystems and natural capital can provide versus what we can take without having minimal, what take by having minimal uh, effects on nature? Hmm, that's a great question. I don't think, I, I, I think no would be the short answer. I don't think we're, the goal is to tip the scale because again, you have to be sensitive to the audience that you're speaking with. And those are the terms that the audience that we're dealing with speaks in. So it's hard to change the narrative. It's hard to, to just change the narrative to something I want because I need to be sensitive to what the businesses, are, the conversations and the, the, the frame of mind in which the businesses operate. I have a question that's off the topic, um, but it's all in <laughs> uh -oh. our minds. So um, I think all of us are really concerned about what happens because of the hurricanes and probably mm -hmm. in Mexico, mm -hmm. but certainly the hurricanes. I'm wondering if you can bring us up to date if you know how NOAA is able to or reacting to what happened in Dominica and oh, that's uh, a great question. Um, Puerto Rico and so on. Just if you have any insights into... I, I mean, we know what's in the news, um, yep, yep. and so we know a lot's been mobilized. But I'm just wondering if you have if you have any inside stories for us. Yeah, I'm trying to think about the the different units at NOAA. Obviously, the Weather Service is heavily involved because they tell you what's coming down the pike, and you know what's the next storm, or hopefully not, the next storm is coming. Um, in terms of some of the other units, I think we support FEMA a lot as well, um, and then the other unit that the marine and aviation operations might have sent ships and, and folk down there. But I think after the storm and the recovery pieces where some of the, the resilience work that um, the National Ocean Service is doing, that's where that comes in. But I don't know, um, I, I, those are the things that come to mind right now in terms of like after, before, during, and after. Um, I think pretty much it's, it's easy. I, it's easy to see where every unit within NOAA has has a has a has an influence. I think like the fishery service, I think will do a stock assessment, like to look at some of the endangered species and do stock assessments afterwards. But um, again, I think we have our fingers in in many little places. Sometimes before, sometimes during, sometimes after. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask about sort of natural resources policy leadership. And mm. so we think of, you mm -hmm. know, I think we all think of us as, as training the future leaders here. Um, and I wanted to get your insights on leadership because one of the things that struck me listening to your talk is I think we often think of the government and the government agencies as sort of providing this framework that sets the path of leader, you know, that maybe the administration through the agencies could set this path mm -hmm. of how things are going to go. But particularly sort of the second half of your talk, it really seemed like the agency was latching on to corporate or, um, you know, NGO or multinational institutional leadership that wasn't necessarily, it was sort of latching on as opposed to really being in a leadership role. So I'm kind of curious if you can think about the different places where our students might look to be leaders in these spaces. Oh. How much of it's in government and how much of it's outside? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say, obviously, the fellowships, like McNow's Fellowship, is a great opportunity to get involved in some of those conversations that are happening um, at higher levels than even just NOAA. Um, I, I believe you had a couple of students placed in some of the higher offices. Um, I would definitely recommend looking into those. But in terms of leadership, I think, I, I, I think we're in an interesting position in that we're both as much as we are kind of um, involved in the top-down stuff and, you know, getting direction from the administration. I would view the, the stuff that we're doing with natural capital more as a bottom up. So we're socializing the sound science that is coming out of all these partnerships. And, and, um, and in that way, I think we're, we're, I guess we're not necessarily leading, but I think we're keeping up with what the conversations that are happening. I don't think we always can lead or necessarily should just because 
the processes that go on in our agencies are pretty, as I mentioned, pretty slow. So I would say that um, it's not always about leadership, but I, I think it's always, it, we need to kind of keep up to date with what's going on so that when that policy window opens, we can say, hey, this is a great idea. So, um, so uh, the question I have was, is when the Clinton administration introduced ecosystem management mm -hmm. as, a, as, as a tool, there was a lot of writing at the time to say um, ecosystem is just an operationally defined term and it's not clear about how one would define it. Mm -hmm. And it seems we've moved far beyond that to ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. So I wondered whether or not you felt there was a clear understanding, say within NOAA, or whether there even needed to be of what an ecosystem actually is if we're trying to manage for the services that come out of them. It depends on the management question. Like what your ecosystem is defined by whatever management objective and whatever question you're specifically looking at, if that makes sense. Because then you're looking at the interactions that affect whatever thing that you're interested in. So I, it's flexible, I think. I, is that flexibility good or is that a limitation in some settings? <laughs> the standard answer is it depends. Um, I, I, but I, I genuinely think it depends on, again, on the management question and the management objective. Like, what are you trying to do influences how you view your ecosystem and then which interconnections you look at. Uh, and people are really comfortable with that kind of nuance when you're talking about ecosystem management and services? At NOAA, I, w I would say so. I think we're very clear about what it is that we're which management objective we're striving for, and then setting the parameters around that in terms of the ecosystem that we're looking at. So I have a, I have a quick question, which yeah. is, um, I think about, you know, NOAA provides this data and these services with mm -hmm. remote sensing data for, for weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. um, and we care about weather and weather forecasting is important to us because it impacts our day in kind of a number of different ways and mm -hmm. maybe it impacts companies' bottom line. You can make the same argument for natural capital, and mm -hmm. you can make the same argument that NOAA has remote sensing data mm -hmm. on natural capital that would help companies lower the cost of incorporating ideas of, of natural capital. Mm -hmm. Is there some opportunity, or is NOAA trying to make remote sensing data that they collect um, you know, geared toward and facilitated towards people thinking about natural capital, given that I'm sure mm -hmm. the weather data is also Is forced? also in there. Um, well, and is tailored toward people making meteorological forecasts. Not, not to my knowledge. That's a great idea. And should they? Because <laughs> I think maybe they should. I guess that's one of the things. Oh, that's a great idea. Maybe since when I take when I talk about the natural capital project at NOAA, I really mean just me. So you're looking at the natural capital project at NOAA right here. Oh, you know, Monica. I, ca I cannot say that entirely. Monica Grasso is 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 you know technically the person there, but. Um, I, I like this is it. So I'm, you know, working with these, with all the partners, and kind of leading that charge. Um, but no, that's a great idea. Because I'm thinking that Noah's strategy for weather. Noah mm -hmm. doesn't make policies that make people respond to weather. Noah just tells you what's going to happen in the future. Exactly. And the same could be said about natural capital. Mm -hmm. That Noah just needs the partnerships with policymakers on multiple scales. To, to say, here's the data that we have, and here's what we think is And here's is how you can apply it. Yeah. To wetlands, to fisheries, hmm. to whatever. One of the things that we've been trying, that I'm still trying to figure out how to do, is the Census Bureau has this great tool um, called, um, I think it says Census Business Builder, where if you want to locate your business in neighborhood X, it tells you everything you need to know about the demographics for that specific area. Um, one of the things that would be really cool to do is integrate that with, like, environmental data. So how can we get like flood maps in there to say, hey, um, if you locate your business here, it's going to flood and that's not a good thing. So um, the remote sensing data would be a great, would be an interesting addition to that. Hmm. I will attribute that idea to you. So <laughs> you, know, you know your name at the end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>